Good evening, everyone. It's good to be back with you. We will uh, be flying solo tonight. Kyle is not with us. He is with the kids at church camp, so he's going to be uh, wrapped up and doing that for the next couple of weeks, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, tonight will just be me, and uh, without Kyle here, this lesson may go a little quicker. Um, I want to start off by talking about shoes. I've often wondered what it would be like not to have good shoes to wear. Um, we, we're so blessed in this country to have such a variety of shoes, but imagine what it'd be like if you just couldn't find any shoes to wear. Of course, in the winter, our feet would freeze. Uh, we'd probably have injured feet from walking, walking around without some kind of protection. And then when you have to go to work, imagine working a job without shoes or having the right kind of shoes. I mean, I wouldn't want to work on a construction site without some good boots on, some steel toed boots. And I wouldn't want to try to, uh, play sports, you know, especially basketball without having the right kind of shoes or any football, whatever. You want to have the right kind of shoes on. If I go walking, you know, I want to have some some comfortable walking shoes. I want to have a good arch support. I want them to be cushiony if I've got to stand on my feet for a long time. You know, I've had jobs before, and like some of you may have jobs now where you have to stand on concrete for a long time. Well, that can be rough if you don't have the right kind of shoes. So shoes are important, and tonight – the Apostle Paul is going to talk about having the right kind of shoes on spiritually. So let's pick back up uh, with Ephesians chapter 6. And Paul's been talking about putting on the full armor of God. And tonight we're going to look at our next piece of armor. But before we do, uh, let's go ahead and, and read the text again. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, I'll start reading in verse 13. It says, Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So think back to the beginning, uh, starting in verse 10. I'm not going to read that, but in verse 10, he tells us we're engaged in a, in a spiritual battle. We're fighting these, these forces of evil in the in the heavenly realms and so um they've got air support you might say and we're against a serious foe uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood in other words there's there's demonic and evil forces in our world that are allied against us and if we're going to stand strong we must put on our right equipment i've been calling it the ppe personal protective equipment uh paul's using military uh, equipment here it's, he's he's in a he's chained up uh, he's under house arrest i don't i don't want to go too far thinking he's in like san quentin or alcatraz or something but he's under house arrest and he's chained up to a roman guard 24 7 who most likely has his armor on or maybe it's on in the corner over there and he, he's like looking at the guard and looking at the armor and making these spiritual applications and so uh let's do a little bit of review before we talk about uh, the shoes that we're supposed to supposed to have on uh you know he tells us first of all to put on the the belt the belt of truth. Now, to the Roman, the belt was the first part of the equipment they put on. You may not even think of it as equipment, but it is equipment. The belt held everything together. It, it held the tunic in closely so it didn't get tangled up in it. Uh, the breastplate, this, this bronze breastplate actually connected to it. Um, his uh, scabbard that sheathed his sword hung from it. So the, the belt was, was very important. It kind of kept everything together. And Paul looks at this, this belt on the Roman soldier and says, okay, the truth is like that belt. For the Christian, we're going to be in a, in a spiritual war. We've got an enemy that's against us. And the first thing that we better have on that's going to hold us together spiritually is the truth. Never underestimate the importance of the truth because if we don't hold to the truth, we're wide open to the devil's exploitation and manipulation. Uh, the truth is of the utmost importance. It's the first thing he mentions. And then we kind of broke this down a couple of weeks ago into two, two sections. There's a, there's theological truth and then there's ethical truth. Now the two kind of go together, but the theological truth by that, I mean the, the truth about God, you know, who, who God is, what character traits God has, what, what does God require of us? Remember in John uh, chapter four, he, Jesus said the kind of worshipers that God is looking for are those who worship in spirit and in truth. So God wants us to have the right concepts in our mind when we when we worship him. So 
What a church believes is important. You know, Paul tells Timothy to hold on to sound doctrine. Uh, doctrine, this refers to the beliefs or the truths that are found in Scripture. So, so as Christian people, we, we really need to strive to know God's Word, the truth in God's Word, and, and, and take, it, take it seriously. And I'm convinced that when, whenever you deviate from the truth, there's going to be problems. Uh, so we don't want to get uh, in such a... See, if you get your thinking messed up, it messes up your actions. That's what I'm trying to say. But on another note, you know, it's pleasing to God when we have the right concepts in our mind when we worship Him, when we worship Him. And the other kind of truth would be, again, the, the ethical truth. That means, you know, not lying or, you know, cheating, that kind of thing. Uh, dishonesty. Because when we, when we lie, Jesus says we speak the devil's language. So we must be people that really adhere to the truth if we're going to stand in this spiritual battle that we're engaged in. And the devil's going to do everything he can to get you to, to question God's truth. We see that right in the Garden of Eden with, with, with Eve. Uh, you know, did God really say, you know, just get questioning the truth. And the devil sometimes twists the truth. Remember when Jesus was being tempted, what was the devil doing? He was throwing scripture verses at him, but out of context and changing what it was meant to say a little bit, you know. So, so be, be careful about being uh, taken advantage of by those who might uh, distort the truth. Hold firmly to it. Okay, the next piece of armament that he, he mentions, I should say the next piece of protection that he mentions, because technically a belt's not armor. So anyway, is is the breastplate of righteousness. And this was made um it was made of bronze, which was light but strong. And this uh breastplate, let's see the picture here. Actually, I can get ahead of myself. The breastplate was light, portable, but strong, and it protected the vital organs, heart, you know, the lungs, um, liver. You know, it it was very important that you made sure you had it on. And Paul looks at this 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 armament, and he says that it's a uh, it's a uh, it's it's your it's like righteousness. As a Christian, we we must put on. Uh, righteousness, and you say, "Well, John, what is righteousness?" Well, righteousness, in a in a in a very simple definition, it means conforming to God's standards. It means living right, uh, living how God wants you to live. It 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 carries the idea of uh, straightness. It's like it's like God has His standards are straight. You know, we talk about the straight and narrow, but God has His standards, the, the straight uh, standards of God, and we're supposed to to parallel that straightness. And if we if we're crooked, we, we don't. So God didn't want us to be crooked people, people who have uh, deviated from the standard, people who aren't aren't living out God's precepts. Uh, that would be a crooked person. And we're supposed to be straight. God wants us to be straight, righteous people that have conformed our lives to His holy standards. Okay, let's brings us to the next uh, piece of equipment we're supposed to put on. And that is the feet fitted with uh, readiness, depending on what translation you, you have. I'll look again at that in uh, verse 14. Last part of it, 15, I should say. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So the kind of shoes that the soldier would wear, these these sandals, they technically they're called uh, caligae. Uh, these were heavy, soled military shoes or sandals, which were worn by Roman legionary soldiers and auxiliaries throughout the history of the Roman Republic and Empire. Uh, they were worn by all ranks up to and including centurions. Uh, the sandals were constructed from leather and laced up uh, the center of the foot and uh, they had these spikes on the bottom. They were technically called uh, iron hobnails, which were hammered into the sole, um, which served three purposes. For one, it reinforced the sandal. Uh, it provided better traction. And they could be used as a weapon. The soldier could, you know, inflict a lot of damage with a... Uh, with stomping and the picture here looks like these these 
these uh, nails look kind of blunted off a little bit. But from what I understand, in some cases they were they were pretty sharp, and it, and it makes sense because if you're on the battlefield and you're in rough and rocky terrain, you would want to have good solid footing. And again, if you wanted to stomp on somebody, you'd want these these cleats to be uh, somewhat sharp. But one of the things that that made the the Roman soldier so efficient is his ability to march great distances. And one of the ways they were able to march great distances is they were able to wear these these leather sandals, which were very lightweight, but because of the nails in the bottom, they were very strong, and it allowed them to go great distances. Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar were successful in part uh, because their soldiers were so well shod. That's what the historians tell us. So, so they were very significant when it came to uh, fighting and being engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You wanted to make sure that you, you had, had sure footing. Now, Paul makes the application here. He, he refers to these sandals as uh, having something to do with peace. He says, with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Feet being fitted. That's the way the NIV puts it. King James Version says the f the feet shod. Riddle, the word uh, originally means to strap on or bind under. When you look at the, 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 the next word there, talking about readiness in the NIV, and it's also translated as preparation in the King James Version. Um, it, it doesn't bring it out here, but the part of the meaning of that word is, is, is foundation. And many scholars believe that 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 this word, the word foundation, should be should be included in, in this description as the Amplified Bible translates it. Let me read it to you from the Amplified uh, Bible. It's, it says, uh, "And having shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with the firm-footed stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel." of peace. That's kind of a long definition. Keep in mind the Amplified Bible, when it gives you the, the Greek word, it, 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 it's not making up stuff. It's just showing you all the different shades of meaning associated, associated with that word. And this, this idea of uh, sure footedness uh, is, is included in the, in that, that translation. And, and, and I like that firm, firm footedness. Definitely. I believe when you look at the context is certainly part of the idea. We, we want to stand firm footed spiritually when we engage the enemy. For example, if you, if you look back at, at the text, if you look back at verse verse 11, it says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your what stand against the devil and then you can you can drop down to uh, verse 13 therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of, day of evil comes you may be able to to stand see the word stand keeps keeps showing back up and then and then it goes on to say uh, in the in the last the last word in verse 13 is stand and the first word in and 14 is stand see that the very last word to stand in 13, very first word in 14, stand. So we see stand, 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 stand. So I think what he's getting at is here we need to be able to stand firmly to fight the enemy. And if we're going to, to fight effectively, we have to stand in peace. Now, I know that's almost ironic. We're talking about war, and he's talking about having this sure, sure-footed foundation of peace. So it's, it's almost ironic. And I think he's doing that on purpose. But if you stop and think about it, if we're going to be an effective fighter, we must have peace. And by that, I'm talking about inner peace. Uh, uh, if we're going to be effective soldiers, maybe think about a quarterback. If you, if you follow football, football much, um, do you want a guy back there that's uh, not composed and, nervous and and scared and you know you, you want a guy back there that's cool calm and collect kind of like a tom brady you know people are falling all around him and people are coming at him but he's got his mind he's got his he's looking around he's finding the receiver he's throwing it downfield he's not coming all to pieces in the pocket that's kind of the idea here we're supposed to stand in peace 
as we fight the enemy. We're not people that 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 come undone. I like the way it's, this Greek word has been uh, defined. This word peace it refers to the inner tranquility and poise of the Christian person whose trust is in God through Christ. Let me read that again. Peace here refers to the inner tranquility and poise of the Christian person whose trust is in God through Christ. Uh, Another definition, according to Thayer's lexicon, it says, of Christianity, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is. Like the idea of uh, uh, tranquility, you know, being being at peace. There's kind of two ideas to here also because once you become a Christian, you become at peace with God, and having a peace with God should allow you to have an inner peace no matter what you face in this life. Um, li- like it or not, when someone's not a Christian, they're at odds with God. Scripture's pretty 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 plain about that. You know, we're 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 enemies with God until we come to Christ. Romans 5, 1 states, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's through Jesus that we can have this peaceful relationship with God because Jesus took care of our sin, which is allow which allows us to be in this relationship of peace with God. We're not in a state of hostility with Him anymore. I like what it says in Colossians 1, uh, 21 through 23. It said, Once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through faith, uh, through through death, to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, I like the same idea of firm is there, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. So our peace comes from being sure-footed in the gospel. The gospel is simply uh, the good news about who Jesus is. And that's where our peace comes from, Jesus Christ. Peace with God, and because we got this peace with God, then we're, we're free from inner, inner turmoil. Uh, we can now have inner tranquility. You know, I was trying, trying to think, well, what, what could... What could the devil throw at us to really uh, mess with us when it comes to our inner peace? Because that's kind of what we're talking about here, having an inner peace about you. One of the ways he could disturb our peace uh, would be through guilt, uh, heaping guilt upon us. That can really um, disturb someone's inner tranquility. We know as Christians that Jesus Christ took care of our sins at the cross. So we shouldn't be going around feeling guilty, but what we know we shouldn't do and what we do sometimes two different things. There are some people that continue to be guilt ridden. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is I I even knew a lady once that didn't take the Lord's Supper because she didn't feel worthy. She just felt just too much of a sinner. Well, in a sense, none of us are worthy. Uh, None of us are perfect. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't try to, to live a perfect life. We should do everything we can to live the best we can. That's back to righteousness. We're to strive to live a righteous life. But sometimes people just can't forgive themselves for something they did in the past. And the devil, that's part of what he does is accuse people. Maybe he accuses you of what you did years ago. He just keeps bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up in your mind. Battles in the mind a lot of times. Probably most of the time, for truth be known. He keeps trying to make you feel guilty. And what you need to do is remember, no, I'm forgiven in Christ. Jesus has taken care of that. You know, God separates our sin as far as the east is from the west. That's just a way of saying God takes it away. I like it when somebody says uh, God hurls our sins in the deepest sea and posts a no fishing sign. I like that. We're not supposed to be dredging up, pulling up uh, things that God's already forgiven us of. But the devil sometimes will try to make you feel guilty and kind of paralyze you and take you out of the game. Good example, maybe they need volunteers at church. Maybe there's something that needs to be done. Maybe there's a, a class that needs to be taught. Maybe there's a communion meditation that needs to be given. You could, we could go on and on with this. But you never do it because you just feel too guilty. You just, well, man, I've, I've had people tell me, 
things like this. Oh, you just don't know what all I've done. Oh, my past is so, you know, all these things. That's the devil keeping you paralyzed and keeping you pinned down. You need to realize you're forgiven in Christ if you've taken your sin to him. Once you come to Christ and put your faith in him, you're baptized into Christ. Your sins are washed away, Scripture says. And you're a new creation. So don't allow the devil to mess up your inner tranquility by bringing up your past. We're supposed to be free of guilt. Jesus took care of our sin. As long as we're standing firm on the gospel of peace, we're free from what I'm going to say, the inner turmoil of despair. By that, I mean we shouldn't feel hopeless as Christian people. We have a lot to look forward to. Our mind really can't even conceive what we have to look forward to. Uh, like they say, it's out of this world, literally. Um, heaven awaits us. We can't really imagine how good it's going to be, but it's going to be good. That's the great hope that we have in Christ. Uh, one day there's going to be a resurrection. We're going to have a resurrected body. Uh, we're going to have a glorified body like his glorified body. That's that's part of the hope that we have in Jesus. Death is not the end for us. We We live on. On top of that, even in this life, I believe Romans 8.28, applies not only to the next life, but also this life. Paul writes, and we know that in all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You now, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you've given your life to him, you love, you're loving God, you know, you've answered God's call in your life, you, you know that things are working for your good, no matter what it is. Sometimes we forget that and we lose our, our inner peace because uh, we feel hopeless or we feel like life's going nowhere. Things aren't ever going to get any better. What's the point, you know? And, and people just accept depression and accept uh, hopelessness. But that's a – the devil – I'm not, I'm not going to blame – you know, sometimes people do things to themselves, but the devil would love to get you down and out – and feeling hopeless and useless and full of despair. Why? Because he's neutralized you when he can do that. When he can load you down with guilt, when he can make you feel full of despair, he knows you can't be the, the soldier that God has called you to be. We're in a battle. The enemy's coming at us. And if we're going to stand strong, we have to have this inner peace about us. Do not fall for the devil's tricks and allow him to mess with your inner tranquility and along these same lines we need to be free of worry um, most of us probably deal with worry <laughs> all the time there's so many things to be worried about but um, i'm telling you god does not want us to be people full of worry because worry is a lack of faith worry is a it's a lack of trust and it really pleases God when we trust him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, the Bible says. And when we're full of worry, we're not, we're not being people of faith. We're not, we're not trusting God like we should. And that's not pleasing to him. He wants us to put our trust fully in him and allow him to work things out. Matthew 6, Jesus says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What are all these things? What we shall eat, what we shall drink, what we shall what we should wear. Um, in the context there, he's saying we shouldn't worry about what we call the necessities of life. If you put God's kingdom first and his righteousness, in other words, you your God's kingdom and its expansion here upon this earth is you're you're putting that first in your life and you're living for that, and you're righteous, you know, you're conforming your life to his standards, God's saying there's no need for you to worry. He's got it. He's going to take care of you. Don't let the devil mess with your inner peace. Now, of course, if you're not putting God's kingdom first, you're putting everything else in the world before God, and you're not living a righteous life, I'm going to say, yeah, you got a lot to worry about. You should be worried. I mean, you, but God's saying, I, if you put me first and my kingdom and you live for me, there's no need for you to worry. He's saying, I... I got this, and we have no need to be anxious about anything. Paul goes on to write in uh, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, he says, Do not be anxious about anything. Anything covers a lot of ground. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, 
And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So he gets a little more specific here and tells us how we can maintain this inner peace. And first he mentions prayer, prayer and petition. And so we, we go before God in a, in, a, in, a, in a worshipful kind of attitude, and we take our petitions before him, tell him what we need. And notice it says thanksgiving there. And we spend some time thanking God for how he's taken care of us in the past. And as we're reviewing how he's taken care of us in the past, it helps us have faith he's going to take care of us in the future. Never underestimate the importance of thanksgiving. Always uh, be mindful of God's gifts to you. Always be mindful of his blessings. And as you're mindful of those blessings, you, you thank God for them. And that's going to go a long way in helping you have the peace that you need to have that transcends all understanding. And I like he says, well, guard your hearts and minds. <laughs> guard literally is what it sounds like. It refers to a, a soldier standing guard duty inside the walls of a fort. Uh, God wants to stand guard duty inside your heart and in your mind uh, in Christ Jesus to give you this peace that surpasses all understanding. But again, part of it is involved with, with prayer and petition and thanksgiving. We all need peace if we're going to be victorious. If we're going to stand, we have got to have that firm foundation of the gospel under us. So Jesus and what he came to do for us on the cross and God reaching out to us through Jesus, that's our foundation. That's what we're standing on. And as we stand, we're able to be a more effective soldier for the Lord. I once saw a bumper sticker uh, that really pulls all this together nicely. It says, no Jesus, as in N-O, no Jesus, no peace. And then it says, no Jesus, no peace. K-N-O-W, K-N-O-W. So it's no Jesus, N-O Jesus, N-O peace. K-N-O-W Jesus, K-N-O-W peace. Probably would help if I had written that out. You could probably see it better. But the idea is if you really know Jesus, you're going to have peace. And with that, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the PPE that you provided for us spiritually. Uh, I pray that we would all put on this uh, uh, protective equipment, Lord, this personal protective equipment, as we uh, strive to advance your kingdom. Uh, you've, you've called us all to be uh, soldiers for you, Lord. And um, I pray that we would Always stand firmly on the gospel, on the good news about your son, Jesus, and who he is and what he's come to do for us. May we all have this inner tranquility, this peace that we're going to need to have if we're going to be uh, the fighting, the effective fighting force that you, you've called us to be. We just thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be a part of your army. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi there. I'm John Wagner, minister of New Discovery Christian Church here in Hernando, Mississippi. And I wanna thank you for visiting our YouTube channel. I do hope you enjoy the sermons and I hope the Lord builds you up through his word as I do my best to present it to you. If you're ever in the area, feel free to drop by and check us out live and in person. Once again, thank you for checking out our YouTube channel.